Hey, what's going on guys, Leo. So we're going to uh, take a look at Bitcoin Maxi's valuation logic because they're saying that Ethereum should have been valued at 19,000 back in 2024. So we're also gonna take a look at some news. So let's go ahead and dive on in. So I put this post out. Now Bitcoin Maxi's be like, ETH has no value. It's not sound money. Meanwhile, Ethereum makes more in revenue than Bitcoin. So Ethereum makes, uh, for in 2024, Ethereum made $2.5 billion worth of uh, transaction fees, and Bitcoin only made $922 million in transaction fees. Ethereum has a lower uh, inflation rate. Uh, it's coming in at 0.05% per year. That means how many, how many more tokens are issued every year. And then Bitcoin's issuance is 1.387 per year. So so we can take a look at uh, ultrasoundmoney.com. You can see a visual of that here, how Ethereum supply has stayed absolutely steady while Bitcoin's is inflating still. So we come back over to here to my post. Uh, Ethereum is also a, a yield-bearing store value, meaning that you can buy Ethereum and earn yield by holding it. Uh, Ethereum secures the digital economy, which in my view makes it a much stronger store value than Bitcoin. So what's what's the fundamental differences between Ethereum and Bitcoin? Uh, well, Bitcoin, their whole thing is they're basically competing just with gold. Their, their spiel is, hey, you know, we're digital gold, we're better than gold, we're a store of value, you can park your capital here. At the end of the day, it's just an asset where you just, you, you, you store some of your wealth. Ethereum is basically Bitcoin, Plus, you get yield built into it. And now that we have options available, you can sell uh, covered calls to earn even more money if you hold the, uh, the spot ETFs. But it's more scarce, and its store of value is backed by the digital economy that Ethereum secures. So it's not this abstract thing that, well, you know, you have faith that Bitcoin will continue to hold value. But let's dive in a little bit deeper here. So using Bitcoin's own valuation logic... Ethereum should have been priced at 19000 back in 2024. Uh, so how do, how do I come up with that? Well, Ethereum has been attacked a lot by people saying that, oh, you know, fees are a problem. You know, fees aren't high enough because that's how you need to value it. You need to look at the fees and, and that's how you value Ethereum. And so that's exactly what I've done here. But if you're going to value Ethereum, a store of value backed by the digital economy that it's securing, you have to do the same for Bitcoin. You can't have double standards for the same assets. They're, all, they're both digital commodities. If you're going to value one in one way, you have to do it the other. So uh, fees for Bitcoin were $922 million. Uh, in 2024, you had an average price of 43000 So what you do is you divide the fees that it made into the market cap to come up with a, with a, uh, a multiplier, a, a premium, essentially, of how it's valued. And it came at, in at not, it's valued at 920 times, 21 times the fees that it brought in. Now we come over to Ethereum, which is a store of value with yield built in. And arguably what I say is it's a stronger store of value because of the digital economy aspect. It brought in 2.5 billion worth of fees, average price of $3,075 in 2024. And its multiple was only 149. So if we're gonna use the same exact logic, and we're going to value Ethereum based on fees, well, then we do the same with Bitcoin, which means that Ethereum, if it were to be valued the same, it should be 19,000 because you take the 2.5 billion in fees, multiply that by Bitcoin's multiple of 921, and you come up with something like two and a half trillion dollars. But at the end of the day, it comes up to, to 19,000. Interesting. Interesting. So moving on, uh, apparently uh, some whale had been activated and, and, you know, they bought 6,000 Ethereum today. Uh, you know, I just, I see things like this and I never know what to think about it because people buy and sell assets for all kinds of reasons. You know, I, I don't know that it's necessarily a, a, you know, a $10 million purchase is, oh my gosh, you know, that's amazing. And it's cool to see on, on X, but it's not the, not all that crazy to me. So uh, moving on, so tokenized treasuries are skyrocketing. They're kind of making this hockey stick shape uh, as they are just going vertical. And we come over to rwa.xyz here, and we can see that the uh, majority of these tokenized treasuries are on Ethereum. The overwhelming majority, actually. As you can see, there's really nobody that comes even even remotely close. To, I mean, Ethereum has 10 times the amount of uh, 
uh, tokenized treasuries as its nearest competitor being uh, Stellar and then Solana after that. So it's got so Ethereum has 20 times roughly the uh, uh, the amount of uh, what Solana has. And so, you know, going forward, I just expect this to keep going up. We're, this is a trend that we're seeing that just more and more of the world's assets are going to be tokenized onto Ethereum. And so let's take a look at that. Let's see what visually all the world's assets are going to actually look like. So, you know, we, we're looking at these little blocks here, and uh, this is basically Sam Bankman-Fried. This was, this was made back in 2022. And so each of these is representing 100 billion in value, each of these little blocks here. And so now you can see the cryptocurrency market come in next, then uh, Russia, Ukraine, GDP. Now we hear, here we have the military spending. Now we have all currencies. So this is going to be like banknotes and coins. Uh, now we have the, the value of gold. Keep in mind, each of these little blocks here is $100 billion worth of value. And Ethereum being a digital commodity, and being this this uh, digital economy that all world's assets are eventually going to be tokenized and trading and settling on the Ethereum blockchain, I want you to see this as a visual representation of how much money is actually going to go onto the blockchain and where it'll just you know live and exist. Uh, so here we have the all the world's uh, the world's billionaires and all of their wealth. Then we have the central bank balance sheet, S and P five hundred. Uh, we have the U.S. and China GDPs coming in at uh, looks like back in 21 it was uh, 23 trillion and 17 trillion. Now here we have the global money supply coming in. You know this is going to be uh, kind of where uh, you know stable coins come into a play and different versions of stable coins. Now we have the uh, the global stock market, global debt market. And you can just, I mean, you get the idea how big this thing is. One of the uh, the world's uh, biggest asset class is going to be real estate. And again, <laughs> I mean, it's it's really mind-blowing when you see all this wealth. So like for real estate, for example, each of these little blocks, $100 billion in value. $100 billion, And look at them all. I mean, it just goes on and on. And each of these, what this actually looks like is you're going to have titles. So like you'll have a, a, a tokenized deed to a property where it just goes through escrow and gets settled on Ethereum. Uh, and... What that's going to do is allow for escrow to just, it'll be instantaneous. You won't have this month-long escrow search to find out if you actually own the property. It's all going to be instantly verified on a blockchain. So there's a lot of value in that. So here you have a global household wealth. Uh, this first one here is going to be uh, North America. Then you got Europe, China, Asia Pacific, and, and so on and so on. And now you have the derivatives market. So this is going to be like futures, options, uh, all of this. And this is, you know, I believe that this will be tokenized and it will all... Uh, be trading on the Ethereum blockchain. So Watcher is reporting, uh, President Trump says he's had a nice conversation with China and it's going very good. So that is good. That's that's very good because China is going to be, you know, they're going to be the tough cookie to crack here with getting a trade deal. They're putting up the most resistance to uh, these uh, trade negotiations. So the best thing for the economy is for this to be resolved as soon as possible, you know. So the fact that... Uh, uh, the president saying that uh, the talks are going very good, um, at least to me, uh, that that kind of gives me a sigh of relief because I hope that a trade deal is is done, uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm hoping it's done very quickly. So we're going to listen to a clip here from uh, the president. Uh, this was him. Uh, he's kind of gotten into a little bit of a, a spat with uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, and so these are the comments that he had to say about it. Jerome Powell, you said at the termination of Jerome Powell and not come fast enough. He says he won't leave you, even if you ask him to. Oh, he'll leave. If I ask him to, he'll be out of there. But I, I don't think he's, I don't think he, I don't think he's doing the job. He's uh, too late, always too late, a little slow, and I'm not happy with him. Uh, I let him know it, and uh, if I want him out, he'll be out of there real fast, believe me. Jerome Powell, he said at the terrain. So, you know, the president's been making, uh, I guess you'd call him threats to remove Jerome Powell. Now, he technically doesn't have the authority. You know, there's something in government where you have the separations of the branches, right? So you have the central bank, you have the, the uh, executive branch, then you have like Congress and whatnot. So in the only certain circumstance where he could do it is where he has cause, meaning like he's, and, and it's not something you can do based on 
disagreeing on on interest rate policy because that kind of undermines the the Federal Reserve's authority and their independence, which is you know that's not something that you want to happen. So I mean, you come over here, uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Scott Besant uh, warned that removing Fed Chair Powell uh, could rattle the markets, and that's because it it, it creates more unstab- uh, instability and uncertainty within the market because. Again, you're kind of breaking the branches of government there where there's the powers are supposed to be separated so we don't have um, essentially a dictatorship. But the only way that he could really do it is if he proved that he was like grossly incompetent or, or doing something like fraudulent or something really, really bad. Um, that's really the only authority that he would have to be able to remove him from office. Again, that's not politics. That's just how the legal framework is. So... Moving on here, uh, the SEC will host its third crypto uh, policy roundtable on April 25th, focusing on custody issues with uh, panelists from Kraken, uh, Fireblocks, Fidelity, Anchorage, and more. So I wouldn't be surprised, uh, being that this says uh, custody issues, I wouldn't be surprised that this has to do with uh, crypto staking, because I think that crypto staking for, uh, excuse me, uh, Ethereum staking for the spot ETFs is coming. I think it's coming very quickly. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if that gets brought up at this, uh, this round table. So we have to keep an eye on this, see what comes of it. And so with that, I think that pretty much wraps up today's video. If you have any questions, comments, leave them in the comment section down below and I'll see y'all next time.